uh, electronic music's female pioneers, composers, and innovators whose radical experimentations with machines reimagined and redefined the boundaries of music and sound. So to mark the film's release, tonight's panel discussion will explore the making of Sisters with Transistors, um, why it's important that this music and story is heard in today's context. We'll also consider what barriers women and gender minority composers still face in the electronic music world, um, and also look at what changes we need to see and what we want the future to look and sound like. Um, with that said, we're beyond excited to introduce tonight's panellists. They are Elisa Rovna, Laura Murden, Palumi Desai, Lula York and Annie Go. And I'll just briefly introduce our panellists. So I'll start with Lisa. Uh, Lisa Rovna is the director of Sisters with Transistors. Um, Lisa is a French American artist and filmmaker based in London. And her films spring from her fascination with archives and her underlying aspiration to transform politics and philosophy into cinematic spectacle. Uh, Laura Murden is the Chief Operating Officer at Music Hackspace. Um, with over 20 years experience in the consumer technology industry, Laura now runs the Music Hackspace program. Music Hackspace believes that anyone should be able to learn, access and enjoy music technology. And Laura strives to ensure that the program curated is diverse and proactively seeks representative workshop leaders and partnership programs. Uh, Plumi Desai is a multidisciplinary artist and curator. She's self-taught and for over 30 years has been involved in performance, live art, sound and photography installations, interrogating the politics of identity, listening and perception, inspired by her activist and DIY post-punk background. Lula York is a live artist and electronics composer who uses sound, video and participation to create noisy artworks. She runs participatory synth building and performance making workshops, Atari punk girls inspiring women and girls to foster their own creative practice in the fields of sonic arts, music and electronics. And Annie Go is an artist and researcher working primarily with sound, space, electronic media and generative processes within their social and cultural contexts. She co-curated the discourse programme of CTM Festival Berlin from 2013 to 16 and is co-founder of the Sonic Cyber Feminisms Project since 2015. She lectures in Fine Arts, Central St Martins and in Sound Arts at London College of Communication. So we're going to jump in shortly. Um, but before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things to bear in mind. Um, tonight's panel discussion is also being streamed via the Sound and Music Facebook and YouTube channels and is also being recorded and will be available to watch at a later date. And tonight's discussion will last roughly 45 minutes um, and following the discussion there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. So please put these in the Q&A box um, if you're joining the um, Zoom um, uh, event or in the chat box on Facebook or YouTube if you're watching there. Um, we're going to start and end things with something a little bit different. Um, we've asked all the panellists to provide a piece of music or sound that has inspired or is inspiring to them. Um, we call this Minute of Listening, um, which aligns with one of Sound of Music's programmes and is something we often do as an organisation. Uh, this activity encourages deep and shared listening, which we felt chimed strongly with the film. And we hope you enjoy this part of the event as much as we do. Um, so there is a lot to discuss. Uh, I look forward to a really lively uh, discussion. But before that, um, let's do some listening. So just bear with me for a sec while I get this sorted. So we're going to start with uh, Lula. Um, and then um, will um, go on to um, Annie's um, listening. And then um, maybe if you'd like to say a little bit of some words um, after we've listened to each of the um, uh, minutes. Thank you. 
okay so um we started with annie's there actually the wrong way around but um uh, just wait for annie to join but um annie would you like to just say a few words about um why you chose to share that with us yeah sure yeah so that was um a track by gita sarapai um which i discovered from actually listening to paul Purgus's recent BBC Three, I think, radio documentary um, about undiscovered electronic music history in India. And so Gita Sarabhai um, made this track on the first ever Moog modular synthesizer that was brought to India in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, so the project that Paul Pergus has done is really wonderful. Um, yeah, I really recommend going to listen to that documentary. So yeah, it just opened up a whole kind of um, set of hidden histories um, from non-Western countries um, of electronic music that I just thought was, yeah, really wonderful. I um, really enjoyed listening to that um, track from Gita Sarabhai. Brilliant, thanks, Annie. Um, okay, so we'll um, listen to Lula's um, minute of listening now. Um, Okay. Leela, would you like to say a few words? About... Yeah, um, so that's a, a, a very small clip from a 20 minute long track called Advent Herring by Kath Matthews. Um, and I chose that one because um, you asked for stuff that was inspiring to us particularly. And it was after that, uh, listening to that, that I went off and did electronic music solo um, and kind of left behind the idea of kind of trying to make music in a traditional sense and actually getting leaning more into exploring sound and noise. Um, and what I love about that track is that it kind of starts, um, that, that section is it starts with this kind of idea of the violin and then by the end of this very long piece, it's totally destroyed and there's really nothing of that instrument left. And it's really just about the process um, of having like, you know, yeah, destroyed the sound and uh, there's lots of stuff going on in the stereo field there. And um, yeah, it was just a, a bit of a transformative piece for me personally. So that's why I chose it. That's brilliant. Thank you both. Um, that's really a great way to start. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Victoria, um, to, who's going to start the discussion. Um, so yeah, Vic, over to you. Thank you. Sorry, I was thrown by being called Victoria then. Um, it's a little bit formal, I'll change it to Vic. Um, and I should explain to the audience who's watching as well, um, when we tend to do a minute of listening, we turn our cameras off as we've been doing it digitally, just so we can not be distracted. So there wasn't a glitch in the system that was intentional. Um, thank you, Annie and Lula. I think they were really inspiring minutes and I can't really think of a, a better way of starting this conversation than by listening. Um, Cause one of the many threads that came out of Sisters with Transistors for me was this idea of active, open, rigorous and curious listening 
for all of the women featured. And I particularly love the instructions from Pauline Oliveris's deep listening, tread so lightly that your feet become your ears. I mean, what a spectacular way of thinking about listening. And so because this act of listening, uh, let listening um, oh, sorry about that. Um, because this, <laughs> maybe that was a glitch in the system. Um, but because this act of listening was such an essential thread for all of these composers, Lisa, I wanted to um, ask you, has the making of Sisters, tra Sisters with Transistors changed the way you listen? Yes, very much so. I listen in a completely different way. I hear things differently. I don't have, um, I don't come from a music background. I obviously am very interested in music and sound and, um, but I, my ears are open now. Um, quite literally, I, I feel I feel different after making this film. I feel so much more um, aware and curious about sound. Mm -hmm. And I think the message is also, you know, to go on listening for things or for voices who that haven't been heard. Um, which is Annie, your um, your piece is so beautiful. I'd never heard that before. I'm so excited to listen to that um, radio piece. And there are so many. You know, this is a very important part of of um, whenever I talk about the film. I kind of always start with the idea that this is not the film. It does is in no way a definitive history mm -hmm. of female authored electronic music. It is really just the beginning. What I hope is to inspire. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but what I hope to inspire with this film is is just a curiosity and and yeah, a, a, a greater awareness of the importance of listening both to sounds and to voices that have for so long been silenced. Mm. That's fantastic. And what we will at attempt to do as well with the minutes people have contributed and any more that the panel want to put together to put a playlist together and be able to, to direct further listening. Um, and equally, you know, I open up to the audience if there's a listening you would like to share with us, then please put that in the Q&A and we will, you know, try and share it with the community wider. Um, and I think that's really interesting, Laura, at, at least, sorry, um, because also I'm not, I'm not going to ask you why electronic music, because I just think, well, why not, firstly? And also I really hope we're over that question. I'm sure everyone in this room is sort of thinking, do we really have to do that? So I'm not going to do that. But what I am interested in, <laughs> that's a relief. What I am interested in, Lisa, is what the catalyst was. Was it a piece of music or was it a story or some archival material that you stumbled upon that took you on this journey? Yeah, it was, it was images um, to begin with. It was just these images of women and machines. Um, and then of course the sound, you know, I was just very, very drawn to these women um, and I'm very drawn in general to women who create, I guess, creators, you know, so many women growing up, so many of the women in, you know, that I came or I stumbled across in press or media or books, a lot of them were muses rather than creators. So it was really exciting to discover this incredible group of women creators of music rather than, you know, um, muse. And then of course, I think the main thing for me was just discovering the political aspect to this sound, you know, that this for me was very drawn to this idea of, of this music being, or these sounds or these compositions being kind of the sound to these women's liberation. You know, one of the things that I found fascinating in speaking to Lori Spiegel and in my research in general is something that she says, you know, composing was controversial at the time. And so these, technologies, this new technology was really the reason why, how um, this music was able to reach a larger audience. Because as Suzanne Chioni says in the film, you were the composer, you were the performer, you were the sole arbiter of your creation. And you could then, you know, um, create sound that would reach an audience without having to kind of, um, you know, get money for orchestra and um, all of that jazz. I, th I think that's really interesting. I think there will be potentially um, a lot of empathy in the room for, for some of those ideas around sort of why this was liberating, why, why the DIY aesthetic and 
can take you into a different space that is outside of expected structures. And, mm -hmm. and at that point, I would like to open this up to the panel and, and say, you know, what were your initial responses to Sisters with Transistors and what specifically spoke to you? And is there anyone who would like to start to kick us off? Lula. I'll give it a go. Um, I watched it first as part of the CTM festival um, program and there was a 24 hour viewing period. So the second viewing I managed to cram in and I grabbed my daughter as well and sort of, you know, cause I just felt it was really, really, I was, I was really energized by it and I felt it was really, really important um, for her to see it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I really appreciated having the opportunity to show her actually like a broad brush history of the development of the different technologies and techniques and practices that go under this vast banner of electronic music. Um, and to see women taking a central role in that process of development felt really special. Um, and, you know, what spoke to me was kind of the excitement of seeing through the archive footage and all the historical recordings, like the idea of what music is and can be um, you know, being reinvented in real time, like not just what's possible technologically, but what's, um, you know, the role that music and sound play in society, who gets to do it, how it's done. Um, and then, you know, the artists themselves kind of like interrogating these established mainstream uh, popular classical kind of whatever they might be paradigms, um, like both at the time through that footage and then through their reflections, which was really interesting. Um, yeah, it was just re really illuminating. Um, and then like standout visual moments like Marianne Amasher's house kind of vibrating like with the fabric of her, you know, <laughs> of her being basically being this audio. Um, and then Eliane Radig in a similar way, but actually being moved to tears about finally being able to see some of her work, you know, put on by an ensemble for the first time. And I don't know how long I'm going to guess like 60 years, but I don't know. But, you know, the way that these women like it was part of the fabric of their souls and that really came across in the film and yeah, I was just really enjoyed, really enjoyed it and thank you for making it. <laughs> that's a really wonderful reflection that it, and, and that's how it felt, it did feel like a really visceral experience and it was emotive, it was a real thing. You could feel everything that was happening for these women throughout the journey. I think that's the real success of it alongside sort of how much it is foregrounding the innovation as well. And I, anyone else from the panel, how did it sort of speak to you? Um, yeah, I, I thought also the style of the film, sort of this impressionistic, ethereal quality to it, which sometimes was reflected sonically, of course, by the composers. Um, I was quite envious, actually, just because, um, although, and it set the context, but I was quite envious of the fact that these women had access to a hell of a lot of really expensive equipment or in academia. Um, and it was brilliant to see that they had what they'd done with that. Um, and I like the fact that it set the context of both the sexism, the misogyny, but the cult and the culture of that day as well. Um, that was, I thought, really important that it that that came across. And I think for me personally, the moment, um, especially Pauline Oliveros. And that was incredible to see some of that archival footage. Um, uh, having, having met her in much later years. Um, so that was incredible to see. And also the personal um, archive footage of Clara Rockmore with a sister. Um, that was incredible to see. Stuff like that is, yeah. So I think I think for me also there's a bittersweet thing because like Lisa said about. The, the, there's always a thing about the missing people. And I did feel that even, especially um, considering um, Japan's relationship with um, electronic music, I, you know, I just felt that there could have been, maybe not tokenistic, but a few names mentioned, or even people doing voiceovers or something that could have actually reflected this really rich history of the other as well. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I just, if you don't mind, I'd just like to, um, first off, thank you both so much for the really, really, really lovely words about the film. And I absolutely agree um, with Plumi with your, with your point. I guess the thing about this film is that this film was really made, um, I did all the research myself. I didn't have any money, didn't have any help. I got a little bit of funding from the BFI originally but that literally was just disappeared just in like having to cut teasers for other grants. 
Um, so yeah, I had heard, you know, and I, the other thing to note is that obviously when you're working in this very independent way, it's very difficult to get access to translators, to archive. I reached out to so many places, you have no idea. And I never got a response back. And it was because of my language, because of the block of language, I'm sure. I'm sure that there are women across the entire globe that worked with, with electronic music. But, and this is not necessarily like an excuse. It's just also just to kind of give some perspective to how difficult it was. This archive took me four years to get that stuff together. And there were so many, um, I'm so aware of the gaps in this telling. And this is again, why I chose to, what I, try, what I tried to do with this film was not to, um, it, it's a very subjective history. It's almost like an oral history illustrated. It's, the narrator is not all knowing. The last thing I want people to walk away with is this idea that, oh, now I know about that subject. What I was hoping to do, and again, like it was, it was such a struggle making this film, and I really appreciate. It, and your your point of view is very valid, but I don't know if you've ever tried to reach out to somebody in Japan and like get a response because I tried loads, and not just Japan, but loads of other countries I'd heard so and so you should try, and it was just so difficult to uncover the archive that you see, and that's where I have like language, I have people on the ground, you know. I had a lot of help getting that archive together and it was extremely difficult, but I still think your point is incredibly valid. And, um, you know, what you've just, um, Annie, what you were saying about this thing having just come out, I think that, that we, will, we will experience more and more of these hidden histories kind of appearing. And um, I really look forward to kind of discovering more about women working across the world because you're absolutely right. The focus of my research was US, UK, and France. Why France? Because I'm French, I'm half French, so I speak French. But there are women in 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 in, in Europe as well, like in Denmark, Else Marie Pad, I don't know if you guys all know her, but you know, quite a significant, very important woman working with electronic music, but couldn't find archive, couldn't get any help. Um, and so, yeah, so there are, there are so many gaps in this and I don't want to take any more time, but I absolutely agree. And I hope that people continue, you know, exploring this subject across the world. Thank you, Lisa, I think that's really important. And we will come back to um, some of those questions a little bit later on. And I think it's, you know, there's something for me here about shared responsibility that actually this is, you know, we all, need to get better at telling more stories and I think that's a provocation to everyone in this space but also hopefully everyone watching as well and and sound and music um Annie did you want to tell us a little bit about how the film spoke to you yeah sure I mean I'd echo um the panelists so far I think I just I really enjoyed the archival footage, you know, it was just so rich and it was kind of, um, it was just a real treat, especially, you know, for me, I kind of discovered, I don't know if you know, the ORM, the OHM um, CD collection of kind of the history of early electronic music. I think I discovered that in my, in my local library, Birmingham City Library, when I was a teenager. For me, that was kind of my journey. So when I was watching the film, I was thinking I would have loved to see this film when I was 16. And I think that would have, you know, probably done quite a lot in my mind in terms of role models and what what is possible for kind of um, young women and girls. Um, yeah, so I really I really kind of, yeah, I guess geeked out on the inclusion of you know some of those technical questions or musical questions, the relationship of electronic music to traditional forms of music. Um, I'm a big Elaine Elaine Redig fan, so I really enjoyed. Yeah, she was featured quite heavily. I, I really enjoyed those sections. But um, but yeah, I think I was really bold over. You know, you've just covered this point, Lisa, and um, you know, kind of prompted by Palumi. But I'll I'll come back to it. You know, it was overwhelmingly white and thank you for giving your account of the kind of practical reasons for for that being the case um i suppose my engagement with the field of 
women in electronic music has been for several years now, as um, Heather mentioned, the Sonic Cyber Feminisms project that I run together with um, Marie Thompson um, has been about kind of going beyond this question of representation and what happens if we are just kind of, you know, putting a lot of attention just on making visible women what does this do to the category of women, which women are included? And so I think I went away thinking I was not included. You know, women of color weren't really included. Black women were not included. Um, Wendy Carlos did make an appearance as a trans woman, but I did notice that section was quite short. It felt not as substantial as um, the coverage of some of the other women composers. So, you know, I kind of way, went away feeling like I really, I really genuinely enjoyed it. And I thank you so much for for putting this together it was very pleasurable and I think but at the same time you know we're in 2021 I think we need to ask these questions and and see you know how we can be pushing constantly um I guess not just in terms of representation but also thinking kind of structurally what are the what are the conditions um you know the the constitute the, con the conditions of making electronic music so capitalism white supremacy patriarchy how these work together not not kind of in isolation um so yeah that was my response yeah i mean i think again it's a very valid response i totally hear what you're saying um you know i spent i guess these yeah i mean i don't know what else to say other than what i what i did say but um yeah, just again, just to remind people, like I spent, I spent, I mean, I spent so much time researching this subject and I'm super, super happy that finally some things are kind of coming out. But um, while I've, you know, this film has now been done for a year and a half and um, I started working on it in 2000, what was it too? Anyways, it's, it's, it's great that all of this is, is coming to the service. And I, I agree, I agree. Thank you. I'm, and I'm and I'm sorry that I couldn't have, um, you know, the thing about this film, what I think is so special about this film is the archive, right? Mm -hmm. So you can write PhDs about people with just, you know, one photo and, but you, it's difficult to tell a film in that way. So that's also how I chose my subject. There are lots of other women, uh, white Western women who didn't make the film as well, um, but mainly because the archive is really what drove the film. And just in terms of Wendy, um, I invited Wendy to be part of the film at the beginning of the project. And she, as I'm sure many of you know, is a very private person and um, did not wanna do an interview. And then I asked her as well to participate as a, com as a contributor. So I really tried to include her. Um, it seemed a bit strange to completely, um, to not mention Switched On Back, which had this kind of really revolutionary um, impact on, on our understanding of the electronic music. So I included her in this way, which um, is short and brief, but the other alternative would have been to not include her at all, which I think personally would have been um, a real shame. And I think people, yeah, would have felt more heartbroken by that than what I was able to do. Mm. So that's my response to that. But again, this is not like a, I'm not trying to be defensive here because I think that both of your points are way more valid than anything I've suggested here. I'm just trying to kind of give a little bit of context because I think when people don't, people don't really understand how you make a film and it is like, it's, it's, it's so hard. And, um, and, you know, I spoke to so many academics while I was making the film and, and we talked about like the lack of, um, information out there of, of people of color um, working at that time with electronic music. So there are a lot of people that I spoke to and, um, and a lot of people I asked to speak to that just didn't respond to my um, inquiries. So again, not an excuse, but just to set up the, the just, yeah, to set up the truth and the context behind the choices. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And I think what's actually it's touched on my ne next question which is around barriers and you just shared some of the barriers you faced and I think the acknowledgement in the room from all of us is that we all face barriers in trying to create and actually that's just the reality so I really appreciate you sort of you know helping us contextualize that um and you know the barriers that women still face are not 
it's not exclusive. You know, we're talking about individuals from other gender minorities, ethnically diverse, disabled, financially disadvantaged backgrounds. The barriers are still exist. So the conversation for me isn't whether they do, it's what are they and actually what's changed. And, you know, I sort of, uh, thought about sort of uh, Laurie Spiegel's uh, comment about sort of it, it's still electronic music still being only a space for old white dead men. Um, so I'm wondering, and we will come back to sort of the question of non-white Western women, but I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, many of Sound of Music's audiences will know the names featured in this film, as, as will many of you in this, this conversation, but why has it taken so long for this story to be told and these individual stories to a wider audience? And I wondered if the panel had any sort of thoughts or views on that. Well, it's something um, I've been thinking about a lot, obviously, with the framing of this film and, you know, reflections about how do we tell the story and, um, you know, in what form. And I really think it has to do with, obviously, you know, history has been written by white men. And so that's why we have um, the situation that we have. But I also think it's, it's, it's to do with the way that we tell stories. I feel like we are obsessed in, you know, in storytelling with this idea of a soul genius, one person that invents something. And the truth is, is that that's just not how things come to life. There, are, and Daphne Oram, um, who is one of the subjects of the film in her book, she talks about that. She says, why are we so desperate to find one person or to claim one person as the sole inventor of electronic music? Um, and so I think, or what I tried to do with this film was to kind of move away from uh, traditional beginning, middle and end, one hero, uh, the, three, the three act kind of film. And what I was hoping to do was like, kind of weave um, some, sto some stories that are easier to weave than others, but to kind of move away from a strict chronology to move away again from this like all knowing narrator, which I think is really problematic in documentaries. You know, you have this idea, and I'm not talking about Adam Curtis because I really love, you know, a subjective point of view, but I think so much um, of what's wrong with, so I think when I think about why these women have been left out of history and, you know, the history of women in general is a story of silence. I really believe it is because of the way that we tell stories Thank you, Lisa. Does anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry, Laura, you go for it. I've already had. No, well, I was just gonna say, I, sorry, no, I was just gonna say, it's kind of related partly to the first question, but also to this as well. And I think, because my background isn't as much in a um, classical musical background, but yeah, I come from a technology background. And I think for me, like the, uh, you know, watching the film, it was really inspiring, but also found it really interesting just reflecting on the underrepresentation of women in technology in general, like not only in music, but just there's been a lot of underrepresentation of women in general. And, you know, even down to like, you know, how we now listen to music on our smartphones. And, you know, there are women like, you know, Gladys Mae West who helped, you know, make GPS possible, but that name's not really mentioned and things like that. So for me, it more kind of sparked the, bigger story about women not being represented and then you know how can we then collectively tell these stories of you know women and yeah how to try and get that out there more so yeah I found I really enjoyed I actually watched it twice as well because I watched it the first time and then had to watch it again so thank you um but yeah I think definitely telling the story of you know women and trying to you know show their accomplishments is really important and something that we can all try and be a part of Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. Lydia. Yeah, I was going to just add, like, I mean, I know we've pretty much already covered, like, the question is almost who, who gets to be canon, you know, and it's like, you know, white male tenured professors who could write themselves into history. Um, and obviously the access to those spaces is, and certainly at that time was incredibly limited. Um, but I was sort of interested in the fact that now there is a lot more of a hunger for these kind of stories. Um, and it feels like part of it, it's not just... Um, Part of it, it's because the technologies themselves are quite old, 
Um, and people are now in their own lives seeing how fast technology is changing formats from like, you know, reel to reel tape, CDs, MP3s. And there's like a real kind of understanding of actually how difficult it was to make music in this way or to make sounds in this way. And the film is, it's like just as much a kind of media archeology span piece in some ways, you know, it's really, really fascinating. And I think like that the film sort of has interest on that level as well. And audiences are kind of really interested in the history of media. Like even if they don't realize quite that's why it's like, it is really relatable actually. Um, and it kind of really helps to contextualize like 20th century, like communications and media. It's fascinating. Um, yeah, like I me, mean, Laura Spiegel having to like literally invent the software in order to make the music and like, you know, watching all, all those people kind of struggle with reel-to-reel -reel tapes and slicing them up and stuff. I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of hunger for that kind of, you know, people are interested in that in that side of it. So yeah, I think it's, 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 good, it's good timing. And it certainly has opened kind of doors for people to talk about, you know, who's missing, who else, which is really great. Like I've read more articles in the last couple of weeks about the people that could have been in this film, which I never would have read those articles if the film hadn't been made for the conversations to have been started. So I appreciate that that is, you know, you know, not good enough in many ways, but also it's really great that it has at least opened the conversation. So, you know, it's it's good. I've, I've certainly heard of more people just from this. So thanks. Yeah, and also just, um, just to add, you know, the thing about making this film is that nobody was interested. Everybody kept saying, no one's gonna be interested. It's just not a good subject. It's not, it's not, it's not bankable. Like no one's gonna wanna watch it. And, and even the BBC, they, they refused the project. They literally said, our audience is not gonna be interested. Wow. So yeah, just to go, just again, to, to, to talk about like why have, yeah, these stories not been told before. It's like, it's, it's the, there's so many different um, elements to, to the why, I guess. Mm. There's a question of who's placing value on what, which I think is really interesting here. But um, Palumi, did you want to add something? No. Okay, so, um, so my, my next question, and we're touching upon this, um, but I will, I will ask it directly because I think it's really important and then I will um, hand back over to Heather, but within this contextualization, we know that there's been these women's stories that we've heard haven't been told in this way to reach a wider audience. And it has taken someone like Lisa, who is an outsider of our new music world to help us even you know, bring these stories to light which is really appreciated and has led to a resurgence of conversation. And I think that's another thing that's really exciting. But my, I'm wondering why we think so many non-white Western women and their historic contribution to electronic music have not been explored in the same way, even within the music sector. And I'm not talking outside, why are some of these names completely unknown and why aren't we necessarily doing more about it? Does anyone have a thought on that? I appreciate it's a big question. I'll give it a go. Um, so another thought that I had um, whilst watching the film was this term kept popping up in my head of patch bay nuns, which is um, comes, comes from an article written by someone called Abby Bliss in the Wire magazine many years ago now. And I remember just kind of coming across that term and like giggling a bit because there is this, um, kind of common fetishization of the the kind of black and white photo of the woman at the patch bay and the kind of sexualization of that like woman and machine and um, yeah I suppose that 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 cropped up in my head and you know in those images it's often a white woman and I think there is a unfortunately like a societal inability to kind of be a bit more intersectional about it and you know it's like it's already curious enough that it's a woman that we're seeing there um, at the controls um, of the synthesizer um, and it's kind of one step too far to think that it could be a, a woman of colour. Um, so I think you know there is just a a kind of invisibility that, that happens um, and yeah, a lot of that is due to many different kind of structural issues that combine together, you know, um, 
possibly, you know, many migrants didn't have access to these electronic music studios, hence why there, there are no, or very few, um, if we're talking about the Western world, um, people of colour in the, uh, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, for example. Um, but, um, yeah, I think in, in answer kind of to the previous question about why um, it's taken so long for a film like this to be made, um, I think it's interesting to reflect on the, the form, the documentary film form, because there have obviously been kind of initiatives over the past 20 years, more than 20 years. So female pressure from the mid 1990s, pink noises from I think around the 2000 mark, run by Tara Rogers, um, female pressure, obviously the network of um, electronic music musicians, um, women identified, um, um, founded by Suzanne, Susanna Kirchmeyer. Um, and also Marlo Delara, she's a woman of colour, Marlo Delara's um, Ladies and Noise project, also another network, amplifying work, sharing skills and knowledges. And a lot of that has almost had quite, um, not necessarily an activist, but um, quite a practical, yeah, knowledge sharing um, aspect to it that is less um, about historicising, um, archiving or representing. It's it's kind of a bit more active, it's a bit more about doing, sharing, playing gigs, helping each other, um, set up a tour, um, yeah, that sort of thing. So there have been, you know, all these activities, but perhaps it's just this was the time for the, the documentary film on women in electronic music. Thank you, Annie, I think that's really interesting. Does anyone else want to jump in on that question or have any thoughts? No, apart from to say that I've just heard about this brilliant book, Line the Notes for the Revolution by Daphne Brooks, which I think talks about this exact subject and is literally next on my reading list. So I'm not going to speak on it, but I'm going to read about it <laughs> soon. That's fantastic. And what we might do actually after this is all of the things that are being cited as sort of reference points is also try and capture some of those so that we can share them. Because I think there's some really interesting things coming out of this. And I think there is something interesting there, Annie, in terms of you know, the questions around what was archived, obviously a lot of this material was archived, but was then not officially archived, not easy to access, but it was captured and documented. So somebody at some point thought, well, this is at least interesting, whether it is fetishized or not. Whereas actually, if we're gonna unpick other stories that are more, they may not have even been that fascination at the time. They may, it may be more complicated. So whether it is useful in some ways to, look backwards or to be more proactive moving forwards is a question that I'm I think about quite a lot and I think something that is that deserves more space than we can probably give it tonight unfortunately um but it is something we can come back to later on but in the meantime oh Kalumi please um I think I'd just add that I mean, as, as we talk even now about AI and its own biases, I think we have to just, I didn't want to be the black person saying it basically, so I was just waiting. <laughs> um, I think we have to face up to the fact that there are psychological biases. It's a Eurocentric culture, it historically has been, and it's inevitable that we're still going to have that. And this, this idea of high-low culture as well. And we have to talk about class. At the end of the day, we have to talk about class and wealth and academia. These are all middle-class women and there's some advantage to that of a different era, yeah? I mean, <clears throat> so I think they even crossed over. I mean, I, the little singles um, that Daphne Oram used to do, you know, for kids, mime and movement. I used to dance to that as a little kid, I'm that old. So <laughs> not that old at all. But um, they had access to even that much, which is relatively nothing compared to, when my mom came in, um, from India in the sixties here, she had no access, even though she was a teacher. I mean, it's just, it's a totally different world. And we just have to be very clear about that and not, not I don't know, not cover it up, I suppose, within that. Um, I mean, I'd like to see a lot of DJ culture from the eighties being, included within this thing of electronic music. You know, that's, those are just a few, few little things. And I think Lisa, your point about the way stories are told is so important. And that was so strong in the film for me. And it was, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. Thank you, Plumy. I think that's really, really important. And I think one of the questions later on, especially around 
the importance of education mm. and access. I think we'll come back to this. Um, I do want to hand over to Heather, who's got some questions about sort of now, what's happening right now. Um, so I'll hand over to Heather to take on that section. Thanks, Vic. Um, yeah, so I suppose all we've, everything we've been discussing does really lead on nicely to the now and the context for women making electronic music today. Um, I think one of my observations from watching the film, something that came up like literally from sort of from five minutes in was um, this kind of recurring question about this kind of debate and scepticism that existed in towards the sort of electronic sound world that these women were creating and whether the word music could even really be used to describe the work sort of in and of itself. Um, and I like to think, you know, in 2021, we've moved past that point <laughs> now, but um, so I suppose this is a question for um, Palumi, Lula or Annie, I'd love to know how you feel about this from from your perspective like do you think it's easier or more accepted to to be or or, or, or to call yourself an electronic artist or composer today bit of a big question there <laughs> oh i'll give it a go <laughs> i think it depends it depends on the context still um, I think if you're talking about like academia or funding bodies or, you know, institutions that are geared towards contemporary music, it, it will be generally, I think, pretty well accepted that you're a legitimate thing if you say you're, you know, an electronic musician or a composer who works with electronics. Um, I think that if outside of those realms, it's still probably kind of not really, it's not really understood, I think. Um, but it's, yeah, it's... Um, I think in the mainstream, the words kind of electronic musician pretty much equates to like a music producer, um, which kind of feels to me like it's reducing down the scope of what's possible a lot. Um, and which feels like a bit of a shame. It feels like it's sort of become um, equated with, yeah, with just kind of using a DAW and stuff. And uh, it would be nice to have kind of music education that like broadened it beyond that. But I think we'll probably talk about that next. But um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of fun to experiment with labels and it's a big step even to call yourself as a composer as a woman, you know, let alone an electronics composer. Like I kind of played around with the with the label and then kind of almost felt like I rose to meet the challenge rather than the other way around. Like I think if it, it can be, you know, yeah, it's actually echo what Poonmi says, it's it's like a it's it's a psychological thing sometimes. Um and you've yeah, um, but yeah, that's that's what I think. I think yeah, so I think there's a difference in acceptance depending on the context and who you're talking to. Um, but I think it's still quite difficult in in many ways. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and it's definitely something that we talk a lot about as an organisation that supports composers, and that is our remit of, of what we do. But it's about empowering people to to see themselves in that way, um, but also kind of challenging what that label means, and you know the cat the kind of affiliation and alignment with the canon and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Um, Okay, well, that's, that's brilliant. And I suppose also that has a lot to do with role models in a way, you know, seeing things, seeing people in the mainstream um, that are making the type of music that um, we might be talking about now. But, um, and uh, this is a question for everyone. Um, do we think that as a music sector, and I'm talking about us, um, that we're getting better at sort of telling more inclusive stories that I suppose reflects those who are creating and composing music and I'm talking about sort of electronic and experimental forms of music today. I oh sorry do you want to go Palumi? Oh, okay I'll go first you go afterwards. Um, you know I would say that when female pressure did this intervention the first of a series of interventions I think the first one was 2013 called the Facts campaign which was you know run by volunteers that was simply about counting the representation of you know men and women artists at festival lineups and on um, record labels and they drew these charts and kind of everyone was shocked that the percentage of women represented was kind of like around seven to 12 percent of all these festival lineups and there was a lot of really difficult conversations that took place around that time 
with the largely male curators of those festivals, you know, confronting um, these statistics. And, um, you know, a lot has changed since then. So I think, you know, I'm very wary of um, being too celebratory, but there's more awareness. Um, the systems are always flawed, you know, I think female pressure also as an organization have always been trans inclusive, but I think have updated, you know, the language that they use um, and so forth um, over the years. Uh, so, I'd, you know, I do see that kind of these actions do cause debates and the debates do translate into changes in practices. Um, I mean, at the same time, I think there was a lot of stuff that happened last year in the more like electronic dance music um, scene around Black Lives Matter that was absolutely awful and kind of embarrassing, um, you know, certain um, white artists' reactions or um, to Black artists' comments. I don't know. It was pretty disappointing to see quite a lot of, I won't go into too many details, but, you know, quite a lot of um, um, responses, um, I'm thinking specifically um, in, in electronic dance music. But at the same time, you know, I think these questions of like inclusivity and representation are not enough. And I, I, I know this kind of sounds very academic and, um, you know, I, I am an academic, but I nevertheless think it's really important not to just be thinking at this really individualistic level of kind of plopping in people of all diversity groups in these positions whilst not thinking about who makes our electronic devices that we make music on or that we use for our everyday computing. Um, think about the exploitation that goes into that. You know, I'm not saying I'm innocent of any of that. I've got as many Apple products as the next person. Um, in my field, but it's not about kind of claiming to come from any kind of position of innocence, but it is, I think, depends on what your feminist politics is. If your feminist politics is also critical of, of capitalism, um, as well as, you know, racism and fascism, then we need to keep on thinking, you know, if, if it is just about inclusion, promotion, um, success, in these really conventional ways, then I don't think, for me at least, we're not doing enough with our feminist politics. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point. Um, yeah, you, I'd also, ooh, I'd just oh, like, sorry. I'd like to add that kind of, it's been left up to a lot of kind of black music journalists as well to pick up the slack with this. So there's a publication called Dweller, I think it's online only at the moment, but that kind of essentially sort of um, yeah, it covers the things that should be being covered by the white kind of electronic music press, but isn't because those people, they don't even kind of see the scenes sometimes. So a lot of music journalists don't come from the same backgrounds as the people who are making the music. So for example, like, I mean, um, Rashan Chouan wrote a really good piece a couple of years ago, like directly talking to um, electronic music media mags you know, about the fact that they kind of totally missed out whole scenes. Like there was UK Funky, which was, could have been a really, really huge thing, but was just completely dismissed by kind of white journalists at that time who, you know, they didn't even notice it happening, put it that way, you know, because they're not from the right sort of, you know, they're not coming from the right places. Um, you know, they're not there to see it. And um, yeah, and then there's obviously just like, um, yeah, so it's left up to black music journalists essentially to kind of pick up the slack and that's definitely not fair. So in, in the sense, are we getting better at telling the stories? Like there's more awareness, definitely, but like, I'm not sure that well, we are doing well enough at all, actually. Thanks, Lula. Um, Palumi, will you... Um... I agree with both Annie and Lula. I was just thinking of it <clears throat> just to be um, provocative in a way. I mean. Who's, who's we in the music sector that you described it? And I'm just thinking of, so there's the UK, there's America, then you've got people in India, Australia, New Zealand, wherever, Fiji, Japan. So there's the we there as well. Um, but on top of that, does it matter if we as an experimental music sector or whatever and the gatekeepers and the organizations 
I don't really care if they're more inclusive in, in some ways. I'm interested in the power and the wealth and the money um, and how that could be better distributed in a way. But um, essentially, um, and I quite like the idea of seeing it, the music, we're always going to be two steps behind as these sectors, um, especially the publicly funded sector, of what's actually going on in the ground. So I think maybe Instagram does a better job of it. I don't know, or phone apps. So in a way, in, in a way... I don't know. I sometimes feel like it's actually more exciting, some of it, because people have been inclusive themselves in these different scenes. Um, and I think that 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 is the most exciting point. And I'm just wondering whether the people who have the funding could just without criteria or having to fill in forms could just throw money at it in a way sometimes. And that's all they have to do. They don't need to represent or... Yeah, sorry, I was just being, I was just seeing, trying to see it from a different point of view recently. So it's COVID, COVID adrenaline, I suppose. <laughs> no, that's great. And I welcome to you, Laura. I just wanted to briefly um, respond to Colleen. This, this is brilliant, by the way. The we, I wrote the we, the we I was thinking about was from sound, was from sound and music's point of view, because obviously we are hosting this discussion. We've invited this panel in. So I take the acknowledgement that I wanted to be honest, I wrote the we. Um, what I think is really interesting is there is a, a lot of conversations and, you know, in funded, publicly funded um, institutions around inclusivity. And I re I'm really, I take your provocation around actually, it's about the conversation should be about power and money. And actually that I will, I, that I will take further into more conversations, believe me. So I really, I really like that. Thank you. Laura. I just want to pick on a really on a point that you made there, Palumi, which I thought was really interesting. Yesterday, there was a really interesting, um, it was on Radio 4 in the evening, and they were talking about TikTok and actually how lockdown has meant that people that wouldn't have called themselves composers and collaborators before. And I just think that actually, in a way, uh, more recently, that there are probably more people calling themselves com or, or would actually identify themselves more. And I also thought it was really interesting, even on Radio 4, that they're picking up on the fact that TikTok videos and that, you know, somebody a you know 17 year old can collaborate with you know a 60 year old and I, I just thought that was super interesting so I think there's definitely uh, really the small beginnings of uh, of you know how technology can um can help um but yeah that just sparked an interest there so thank you thanks Laura that actually leads me very nicely on to my next area of, of questioning um so obviously you um uh, a COO at Music Hack Space, um, yeah. which runs a number of workshops and opportunities for people to learn and participate in music technology. And this yeah. is something that you have continued throughout the challenges of the past year um, mm -hmm. online. Um, I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about like what you've noticed during this period, if anything, um, and what music hack space is thinking about in regards to sort of equality and um, who you're reaching at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, I joined the music hack space last year during the pandemic and previously um, they hosted uh, online, uh, sorry, in-person workshops um, at Somerset House. But actually during um, 2020, when we moved uh, all the activities online, actually the number of uh, women participating um, increased. Um, and actually we have we still got some work to do it's like roughly about 30 percent um currently but what's really great is that some of the barriers that might have traditionally been there before so financial if you had to actually travel to somewhere to participate in a workshop but actually hosting it online people can join from literally anywhere in the world and we do have participation from I think it was 67 countries at, at last count but also because we have the hybrid approach between um, either joining a live workshop or accessing it on demand, um, then we're definitely you know really seeing uh, more of a more of a mix, um, and we're really um, trying to proactively seek female workshop leaders and uh, underrepresented uh, people as workshop leaders, and we think that that's really important that we kind of people can see themselves um, uh, being represented. Uh, and we actually worked with Sound of Music on an International Women's Day program uh, where we actually um, created paid employment for workshop leaders and we proactively went out to seek people because unfortunately we do have more men coming to us um, offering to be workshop leaders than we do women. So we're making a positive approach to actually you know, 
find uh, workshop leaders and create um, create that employment, um, but also just really reaching out to communities to join as well. So by offering a mixture of um, free workshops and paid workshops, then we really you know want to create a community where anyone can come and join and learn creative um, music uh, technologies. So. Yeah, it, it's been really interesting and having it online has definitely helped to reduce some of the barriers um, for people and we've still got more work to do. But yeah, we're definitely seeing um, more of a mix, but you know, it's one of our core values to you know, try and make it as inclusive as possible. That's brilliant. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'm mindful of time. So I think, um, I think it's time to move on to the kind of final part of the discussion now. I'm going to hand back over to Vic um, to talk us through the future and, and, and what we want it to look and sound like. Thank you, Heather. I wish we had more time together. This, you know, these are so brilliant. But um, before I move fully to the future, I do want to sort of touch on this question of the importance of education and and actually how, you know, how important do we think that is in changing who is seen, heard, appreciated, understood, moving forward? And I know it seems like a general question, but I think it's, I think it's one we should have. I think, yeah, I think education is important. I feel like the best thing we could do right now to really make everything more accessible is just universal basic income comes back to what you were talking about about capitalism like are you in you know this is the way forward because for so many people it's just not possible like out of college or even before you even get to college you just go straight to a job you have no time to explore your creativity and i think if that if that's the goal here is to to have creativity be more um ex accessible and therefore leading it to it being more diverse, then that's what we all should be really working for. Thank you, Lisa, I completely agree. Does anyone have any other thoughts to add in terms of education and whether there needs to be any shifts or changes? Um, oh, no, Philippe, Leela, okay. okay. I, I was just gonna quickly say that, yeah, there's education, it depends what's been learnt really, I suppose, and the sort of who's 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 set in the curriculum. Um, it, I mean, I know in the wider thing of education, there needs to be a radical shift on the the real structural approach to learning and what is being learnt anyway, and what is knowledge. And I think we need to make that shift, not just for the not just looking at the past um, and colonialism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or decolonization, but also looking at what's going on in the global south today. I mean, we've got wars on. That's a, that's a pretty big barrier to a lot of people learning anything in a lot of countries. Um, so that's the bigger picture. But I think even say for us, like you, us, um, and the music sector. I think again, it's that uh, who's. It's not just about workshop leaders, or as Annie said about inclusivity. It is something much bigger. Um, a bit like Lisa said about the way stories are told. It's the way the education's done or enacted? Yeah, it's like all humans have innate musicality. Like our mothers teach us music through an improvisation, a tiny, tiny babies, like through face and voice and facial expressions, we learn ab about how to communicate essentially through a kind of improvisation with our parents. And we learn about rhythm and we learn about pitch and we learn about communication. And then we have music in our homes, might be in church, could be um, at school, could be popular music on the radio. And we kind of already understand about harmony, uh, melody, rhythm, uh, choruses, middle eights, we've got it all. And then at some point, our innate musicality and everything that we do know about music stops being what music is. And music becomes about like how good you are at playing the violin. And it's like that needs to just be chucked out the window, whatever that is. Um, there's a really, really lovely quote by a guy called Adam Tinkle, and it's something, I'm going to paraphrase it, but essentially, rather than looking at education for music as like getting kids up a sort of ladder to musicianship, what if instead education was self-education, where kids were like citizen scientists probing and documenting the sounding world? Okay, so that, if you take music to be about sound and to be about social relations and to be about like boundaries and space and public and private and all these amazing important things that like 
you know, speak to the structural inequalities in our society. And it feels like education needs to get way more meta in a way. We seem to be like focusing in music education really specifically on this tiny little microcosm of what's actually important. Um, and yeah, so like I've recently read um, Lauren Hayes did a project in Scotland in primary schools. And I think it was like with 900 kids, so like in 10 week blocks, like really, really huge project. I went on for two years. And it was specifically kind of about deep listening, improvisation and collaboration. And then they did have like a box of sort of techie sound toys as well. Um, but they got such an amazingly positive response. And yeah, it, it feels like projects like that are really, really good. Um, I'm trying to do a similar thing in APG where like I started off thinking really about like, you know, changing techno masculinist culture, you know, narrative and like all this kind of quite high, highfalutin, I don't know, academic stuff. And then, you know, by the end, I'm just like, actually, it's just about a magic moment where people feel like their self concept is changed by hearing a buzzing sound. Like it's, it's like you kind of zoom out sometimes really far and it makes it like a lot more relevant. Um, yeah, because you can get really into the, into the nitty gritty, I don't know, a bit too much, but um, yeah, sorry, I've sort of rambled. <laughs> I, I think one of the, oh, sorry, did you want to, I, I was just going to say like the thing that I find really annoying is about education is that people don't believe in people's potential. I mean, this is like, this is it, you know, it's the same with funding, you know, it's like you have to have already done so much before you even actually are able to get the funding. But like the thing that's so, um, yeah, I think that's the thing that I, I really struggled with even making this film is that like people just didn't believe in my potential. It's just because I hadn't done something that people didn't want to fund it. It was just like, well, so I imagine that that's a similar situation with a lot of composers, you know, if they haven't done a bunch of things and they don't get any funding to do more things. And I think we need to, again, universal basic income. And I think, yeah, spread the wealth. Let's stop, you know, the way that we give funding is, is, is is it, it it's logical but i don't think it's the best way i think that we should just give everybody everybody who applies a bit of funding and and see where that gets us rather than just the people who have already achieved a lot thank you lisa um annie did you want any want to add anything to that laura I was going to say, I, I totally agree with those points, but I also think as well, like, you know, maybe there's actually more uh, more of a sort of business opportunity somewhere for actually, because there are so many, um, you know, women that want to learn. And, you know, there are so many women that, you know, women in music tech, it almost feels like there's like an even bigger opportunity. Um, you, know, and for, you know, at the moment we are in this capitalist society, but it feels like there really is like an opportunity, a business opportunity there to actually, you know, Bring this more to more to the front so i'm not sure how we can combine the education but i think it's really you know there's definitely the opportunity is there and i think that's definitely something that you know we definitely need to be growing the pie so to speak you know in business terms because it's not just you know men it's also you know women in tech and we just need to be trying to make that more at the forefront yeah i agree thank you laura i'm gonna have to skip to to probably our last two questions and we'll jump into um some questions from the audience so um before i move on to my final one lisa you've been so understandably and fully embraced by the electronic music and sort of wider music world i guess i'm sort of interested in is, is this exploration in this world going to continue for you or are you what is your what does your next project look like and sound like oh sorry lisa you're on mute um, I'm I'm interested in um, exploring liberation in general. So I don't I think that I've I've given quite a number of years to this um, subject, and um, I am forever going to be curious about it. But in terms of my next film project, it's it's yeah moving into a new direction. <laughs> I want to make fiction. I made documentary also because it's possible to make documentary without, you know, all these connections and experience. Like you can make a documentary, you can start very small with research and you can just do a few interviews and then you can slowly build. And then if you run out of money, you can take a break and you can get a job and you can, you know, 
um, you can't really do that with fiction. So I'm, I'm really excited. I'm hope what I'm hoping is that the, you know, the response to this film will hopefully carry me into a, a different way of working um, and hopefully into fiction as a filmmaker. That sounds fantastic. And I'm sure we will all keep our eyes and ears out for your, your next venture. Um, and before I hand back over to Heather and, and some audience questions, I just sort of wanted to ask, and this is an open question, if, if there's things that the panelists haven't sort of reflected on yet, is sort of what, what does the future of electronic music and composition look like and sound like to you? And that can be an actuality or it can be a hopeful version. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'd like it to be sort of like the last dying squeals of probably the tax evading giants that control tech and everything. So I'd like it to be this sort of whimpering thing. But um, I, th I think what is soon going to happen, I think there's going to be integrated neuro apps and what have you. It's going to be a physical thing and possibly some internal in terms some sort of internal type of recording device of what you immediately can put in a chip or whatever i think um and I, in terms of yeah I, I think that will sit alongside um revivals of stuff you know um and people making their own instruments i think because that's like, like hack space you know incredible space and there's so many places like that all around the world as well um but that's what I'd like it to be, <laughs> the, the dying sound of, yeah, tax evading corporations. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite what I expected, but I think it sounds pretty good that, you know, let's destroy and blow up some more power structures. Anyone else had any sort of thoughts to add in terms of sort of what the future might look like or, or what we're sort of seeing on the, the near horizon? I mean, I would second, I like Palumi's <laughs> suggestion. Um, but I mean, yeah, on the near future horizon, I think um, just because Lula had mentioned Dweller Festival and, um, you know, that's run by Frankie DeGaiser Hutchinson from Disc Woman. So this is a bit more in the kind of electronic dance music realm, um, but also DeForest Brown Jr. Um, um, speaker music, um, who is part of this Make Techno Black Again campaign. And I think it feels, you know, like in the wake of Black Lives Matter that it felt that we were on the cusp of some potentially big changes and that that, that could translate into, to, into the fields that we work in. But it almost feels like we're in this disappointing um, phase right now when it, when it turns out that a lot of that is, is emptier than one would hope. You know, it doesn't translate into real changes in practices. It doesn't really translate into much more than, you know, that that black square thing that people were posting last year. And I think, I think I would, I would hope for is that people's um, claims and proclamations that they make on social media translate into their actual politics and their actions, um, considering kind of what each of us has in terms of privileges and working kind of ethically and responsibly, responsibly with that. Um, even, you know, stepping out of the limelight at times um, in order to do that. So that's what I would hope to be kind of ahead of us. Thank you, Annie. Lula, do you have anything to add? Uh, I was just thinking about like immersive sound experiences just the kind of proliferation of digital spaces. So I suppose that there's more opportunity to compose for those and that they're more likely to be AR, VR, kind of immersive things, but that I would love it if we could do those things in real life. And like, I'm really jealous looking at the sound system Beast in Birmingham and the Huddersfield immersive sound system. Um, yeah, I really hope to be lying underneath one of those soon. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I think we can all agree with that. Um, thank you so much all. Um, Heather, do we have any audience questions? Uh, yes, we do. Um, but obviously, if anyone 
from the audience has any questions that they'd like to ask now, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, Sasha um, says, some of the early sonic experiments and compositions by women, trans and non-binary individuals can definitely be termed psychedelic and sci-fi. Some subjects and themes that were quite popular in the so-called counterculture movements during the 60s. So that's uh, an interesting point. Um, and also asks, why do we think these creative women at the forefront of pioneering electronic music and sound exploration were sort of sidelined during the 60s and later decades when electronic music became more and more an integral part of mainstream pop music? It's a good point. I have a thought, um, which is not my original thought. It's actually through a conversation I had about the film, but one of the reasons, one of the things that came up was also going back to this idea of like, why was this music not considered music? And it was really because it wasn't, it wasn't, you weren't able to commercialize it. You couldn't fit it on a record, which is, I thought was a very interesting point. Um, that's all I have to say. Yeah, and that's actually still quite true of a composer like Marianne Amisha, whose work kind of uh, alludes those kind of like recorded um, uh, mediums is still very much about the kind of architectural installation, psychoacoustic kind of experience as opposed to listening to it on a CD or record. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on that before I move on? Cool, okay, so um, Sasha has another question. Um, so, um, is it always a negative thing to be fetishized as a woman with machines and wires that can quite easily be sexualized and or be the age old muse paradigm? Or is it just part and parcel of our world with social media and so many lives being lived online very publicly? Quite a big question there. Has anyone got any thoughts? I'll have a go, but I'm just trying to think of what is that fetishization with hardware? I'm trying to think of examples. Hard, I mean, if it's a sexual fetishization or is it, uh, I can't think of anybody but with hardware and um, I'm looking at Lula at the moment. And, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny. So I can think, I'm, not, I'm just going to chip in only because you're, I, ha I can actually think of a specific instance where a man, basically said something along the lines of you know oh I'm a sucker for a woman with a bit of hardware or whatever and I did just think oh god it's this weird thing of like you're not like other girls or that there's this whole like really boring long sexist you know thing that's been going on for a very long time where it's sort of like an exception and th and women who are exceptional are somehow better than other women and stuff like that and it's just like not good I don't like it and I yeah I don't think it's good to fetishize women in that way because it's reductive and it's boring and it doesn't make you better than anyone else's rubbish for a start anyway um yeah so yeah I'm gonna say no to no to being fetishized for using a keyboard or whatever Brilliant, thank you. Um, and uh, another question from Fiona asks, um, in terms of the VR, AR potential future that Lula mentioned, how do you think that these mediums can be accessed by say underprivileged youth? We're grappling with all the big questions tonight. <laughs> I mean, I've got no direct experience whatsoever. I, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave that one to the tech giants to work out. Uh, well, I suppose, yeah, I mean, again, for, unless, again, it's whether it can be on a smartphone, but then, of course, access to even that technology. So that is, that is a tough one. That is a tough one. Yeah, I don't think there's an easy answer there. Um, no. Okay, so um, someone else 
asks, um, with the acceptance that we live in a capitalist society and that we need to navigate this system with a degree of subscription to that model, do we still need to draw some lines and what lines should we be drawing? And they give some examples. They're thinking about institutions and partnerships um, that they choose to be of in be part of in particular things like Festival UK, which was, I think we all know is the Brexit festival. Um, this, they say this festival has been criticized by migrants in culture, but many high profile institutions have partnered with it. This is probably a difficult one from the point of view of those in institutions, as they might be able to make some claim to redistributing that money to an inclusive group of people. But we still can't avoid the fact that they have subscribed to be part of a festival promoting cultural nationalism. So I suppose it goes back to the original question about how can we live in a sort of capitalist society um, and still kind of navigate these strange systems of um, funding and institutions and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think Palumi touched on that earlier. Um, I think that do alternative festivals. Um, we've got them, Supernormal um, is one of the most well-known. I think embrace the so-called outsiders or whatever, be weird, um, have some humour with it. And I think, I mean, I've been grappling with this for a long time because coming from um, very working class background to becoming middle class, if you like, financially through, through not through music or art really, but other work um, and trying to persuade other people like me to think about things like co-housing with community spaces, buying woods, land um, collectively, um, thinking about housing, um, like I was speaking tonic housing, um, a charity yesterday, which is an LGBT plus um, housing charity, um, working and it um, working for more senior people. They're looking at actually working with another housing association to try and get some of their properties to actually do affordable housing um, for older LGBT people. Um, those are the sort of ways I think. Um, we've got to think. So maybe it would be like sound and music partnering with a whole host of maybe even private individuals, you know, to look at some of the practical things. Um, I suppose I, there there is, if correct me if I'm wrong, there's a network of um, independent festivals now, isn't there? Like the Joyous Sound. There's there's a sort of network. So I think those those sort of things really help. Um, yeah, do it yourself with other people. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add on if no one else wants to go but I think this really interesting question um and it kind of reminds me of like this really unfortunate but prevalent idea um Grace and Perry the artist recently came out um and it was quite controversial and said something along the lines of you know, in times of economic hardship, like that's where creativity happens. And it was just kind of like, oh no, like we don't, we don't need that opinion. And that is just pure ideology. Um, so I think, you know, I think associations do matter. I think those partnerships um, in terms of bigger organizations, who you partner with, the politics of that, it's super important to attend to. Um, so yeah, I think the question raises a really interesting issue. Brilliant, thanks, Annie. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna end with a comment um, rather than a question. Um, so Rebecca um, in, the, in the chat box said, I was hugely inspired by watching this film. It spoke to me in many ways. I produced this piece straight after watching it. It's the most experimental piece I had made at that point. Thank you. It really was inspiring, especially as a woman producer artist. And there's a link to the piece of music in the chat box for us to listen to afterwards. So yeah, I think that's a really nice note to end on. Um, and I think um, if there's no other um, questions or comments, I'm gonna hand back to Vic. Thank you, Heather. That's incredible. And also I would, um, I would encourage anyone who has been inspired to make something new based on watching Sisters with Transistors or this conversation or anything they've heard recently, share it with us. We'd love to hear it. We'd love to share it further. Um, 
and you know I, I just wanted to thank uh, firstly thank you for the brilliant questions um audience I wish we could answer them all and and you know it makes me think maybe we need to do more sessions like this in the future and have more of these open conversations as an organization and support more conversations um Lisa Palumi Lula Annie Laura thank you for being such a generous um provocative and powerful panel it's been a real honor to hear some of your thoughts and I know there's a lot more to say but thank you for sharing them with us um Lisa congratulations once again on the film I really hope that it receives all the accolades that it deserves um and most importantly I really hope that the the women's names included and those who've contributed become known by many more people and a new generation um who then really will go on to be inspired to blow up some more power structures because I think that's the thing that's exciting me the most. Um, and to the audience who's joined us tonight, um, I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your time, wherever you are and whatever your relationship is to electronic music. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed this conversation and we really do hope that we can start seeing some of you in IRL very soon. Uh, so that's thank yous from me and I think we'll do our last listening. Yeah, we'll do our last listening now. So I'm just going to set that up. Um, okay, so we're going to um, we're going to start the final listening with Laura's minute. Would you like to say a few words about uh, Yeah, just a little bit. So um, this is an artist that I really admire and I actually used to work with um, in uh, in a previous role. And I just really like the, the mix and I chose this track specifically because I really like the synth influence but mixed with indie rock. And I really love the like orchestral arrangements. But um, in particular as an artist um, as well, I really admire um, her as an artist and as a producer and also she's a founder of the 2% Rising Initiative uh, which is for female and non-binary studio artists and I think that's I really like not only the music but also like what she stands for and how she's also trying to lift up other producers and artists as well so yeah that's why I chose that. Brilliant thanks Laura. Um, okay, so um, we're now going to listen to um, Palumi's Minute. Um, so I'm just going to play that now. <laughs> Um, 
yeah, that's uh, um, Morchan, played by um, an improvisation, played by somebody called Shaheen the Blue Rider. She's either, she claims to be the only um, professional um, Morchan female player in Pakistan who also does these huge concerts. And I was thinking of, A, it sounded like, uh, sort of the, some of the rhythm things that reminded me of from Lisa's film with Delia doing the tape flutes and all of that. Just it just made me think of that. Um, but also the very physical thing of it, it's not electronic, but it's it's acoustic, of course, metal. And I was just thinking of the women's mouth and doing metaphors about breath, voice, uh, as the film gave in a way voices to these composers as well. Um, but for me personally, it was when I was a kid and taken to India when I was about four. And hearing this, and I just thought it was like some alien sounds that came from out of space and just really wanted to try and copy it or whatever and find out more about it. Um, and I really thought it was like an electronic sound or something. It was a machine sound. So that's that was my minute. Thanks. So much for that, Palumi. Um, and last but not least, we're going to listen to uh, Lisa's minute. Um, and then um, maybe Lisa, just to kind of end, you can just say a few words about why you decided to share this with us. What I, I just can't wait till we can all be in a space and clap for, oh, yeah, it's, um, I actually, somebody sent me that. Um, the sound recording of an enthusiastic applause is from the BBC Sound Library. Um, and it was a young sound artist called Andres Ortega, is a young so sound artist from Lima in Peru who is currently studying within the arts and media generative arts at the University of Arts in Berlin. So yeah, somebody sent me that and um, just felt really fitting for this moment of, of thinking about sounds that I miss. So I hope to see all of you one day and clap, um, yeah, with a big group. Thank you all so much. I so enjoyed this conversation, it was just, um, Kind of, I'm kind of coming to the end of, of these Q and A's and I, I, yeah, I'm just consistently amazed by um, just how thought provoking these conversations can be. So thank you all so much. Thanks Lisa, that was a perfect minute to end on. Um, on that note, I don't think there's much left for me to say um, except thank you all for joining us and thank you to Lisa and our wonderful panelists today. Um, take care everyone and goodbye. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Yay.